Section 10.1, Temperature and Thermal Equilibrium. The objectives here are going to be to relate temperature and kinetic energy, to define and discuss thermal equilibrium, and to understand the different temperature scales and their applications. So first, to define temperature, we could say it's a measure of the average kinetic energies of the particles in a substance. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So as a result, as we add or remove energy, we change the amount of motion. So as you add energy in the substance, the temperature increases because adding energy means it's moving faster. Okay, so when it moves fast, you have a higher temperature. If it moves slower, you take away energy or you remove some of the energy and it has a lower temperature as a result. Now, if we think of temperature as a relative term, it's really interesting to think about it because if we say something's cold, we really just mean it's colder than like our hand or our feeling, what we feel as a, uh, on our skin. If it's hot, it's usually just like a temperature that's greater than the temperature of our hand. So that cup feels cold, that other cup feels hot, yet they're both cups. They just have different temperatures, and they feel different to us. But in reality, if we were a creature that, you know, say, operated at a temperature of like 500 degrees Fahrenheit, and that was our body temperature, both of these things would feel cold to us. So it's all relative to the actual other object or its surrounding, cold and hot. So thermal equilibrium is when two bodies in physical contact have identical temperatures. And they may not start out that way. So let's say you have a can of soda at 70 degrees, and you have a cooler at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. When you put the can of soda in the cooler, what happens is it lowers its temperature for sure. But it doesn't necessarily get down to 32, because to meet a thermal equilibrium, it means that this has to give away some of its energy, and where can it go? It has to go into the actual ice. So they have to meet somewhere in between, so let's say 33 degrees Fahrenheit. So once that can of soda has fully cooled off, the cooler might only be at 33 degrees Fahrenheit now, because you've added energy to the system. So they're meeting somewhere in between. Now thermal expansion says that in general, if the temperature of a substance increases, so does its volume. Now we know right away that ice is one of those exceptions because of the hydrogen bonds that actually get larger when it turns into a solid. So that's a bit of an exception to the rule. Now a good example here is mercury in a thermometer. We're going to see that when the temperature is at 0 degrees Celsius, the amount of volume is 0.1 milliliters. Now the mass of this is never going to change because it's a closed system. But now suddenly when the volume gets up, when the temperature gets up to 50 degrees Celsius, the volume is now 0.101. So it's the initial volume plus this 0.001 little deviation of, of volume. That deviation causes the height of mercury to go from here to all the way up here. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the volume expanding of the actual substance. Some other examples are wooden doors in the summertime. They expand when it gets really hot. They swell. It's also the humidity that helps. But a better example is even tires on a car. In the winter, tires on a car have, to have a tendency to deflate because of the uh, oxygen gas that's in there. In the cold temperature, the molecules get closer. Now, it's actually better to put nitrogen in your tires. They don't deflate as much because of the thermal expansion coefficient of nitrogen and how it's different than that of oxygen. Another and final example could be like bridges and roads. When the bridges have little like teeth in them that connect little panels of bridges, so like this. And there's another piece of the bridge that comes into contact with this. It kind of sits in the grooves like that. Okay, and the bridge kind of locks together. That allows for some deviation in the summer and winter for the bridge to contract and for it to expand due to the change in temperature. It's also roads because of think of potholes and roads. That constant expansion and contraction of the roads in the winter time and the summer is what actually causes little breaks in the roads which then lead to potholes in the road. Some common temperature scales include Fahrenheit and Celsius and they're traditionally used in everyday life. The uh, 32 there is indicative of the difference in the freezing point of each scale. So for example, if we think about the freezing point in Celsius, we should know that the freezing point in Celsius is zero. That's how the scale was made. And the boiling point is 100. So plug in a zero right here, this term kind of cancels out, and you get temperature in Fahrenheit equals 32. And that's the freezing point in Fahrenheit. So when you plug in a zero there, it does make sense. Um, that's what the 32 is the difference in. Now both these scales can have positive or negative integers. Um, this 9 fifth is also interesting to think about. The 9 fifth and the 5 ninths portion has to do with the difference in the size of the intervals on each scale. So Celsius scales are bigger than Fahrenheit scales. For example, let's say they're both the same there. This is the Fahrenheit side and this is the Celsius side. These increments are smaller. 
And it all comes down to the fact that a Fahrenheit increment is equal to 5 ninths of a Celsius increment. Now the absolute temperature scales include Rankine and Kelvin, and mainly the one that's used is Kelvin here, but we'll talk about Rankine anyway. They're called absolute scales because they cannot be negative. Zero degrees Rankine or zero Kelvins, notice that it's not degrees Kelvin by the way, zero Kelvins, lowercase, when talking about the units, are both considered to be absolute zero because at this temperature all thermal motion ceases to exist. Okay, So the molecules are not moving at all. And what happens as a result is we notice that the Rankine scale, when it starts at zero back here, the Fahrenheit scale is negative 460. When the Kelvin scale is at zero, the Celsius scale is at negative 273, and that's what these differentials are. So they're just scales that are shifted down, like a little bit of a vertical shift. What's interesting to think about is that you can never really get to zero on the absolute temperature scale. And the reason being is that, think about the example before, to cool down the soda from 70 degrees Fahrenheit, we needed something colder than it, like a cooler. Well, if zero degrees absolute, so like zero kelvins, if that's the coldest thing that can exist, right? Thermal motion ceases to exist. Well, you needed something colder than zero kelvins to get it down to that. So if you have an object at 0.01 kelvins, you need something colder to get it down to zero. Well, Theoretically speaking, since zero is the coldest, you can't ever have something colder. So this is a good example of a limit, like in calculus. Zero kelvins would be the limit. It is a uh, boundary at which our temperature scales can reduce to, but no further than that. It acts as a limit. You can get closer and closer, and in science, in labs, we've gotten to close numbers like this. Kelvins. But we've never gotten to zero kelvins, actually. Next we're going to see some temperatures that we should definitely know. So the ice point, or like the freezing or melting point for water, or for H2O I guess you should say. In Fahrenheit it's 32 as we said, and in Celsius it's 0. But the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, so that makes sense, right? 0 and 100 as numbers, whereas Fahrenheit is 212. Now the Kelvin scale is obviously just 273 degrees above whatever this is as we said before, and then it is really 0.15, but I'm rounding in that previous slide. Let's look at the applications now that are important for Fahrenheit, using for weathermen, for medicine, and for like non-scientific use in the U.S. So things like body temperature for medicine, right? Or the weather. In other countries outside the U.S., it's used for those same things, and then also for other sciences internationally. For a lot of sciences, Celsius is used. But for things in physics, mainly physical chemistry, gas laws, astrophysics, thermodynamics, you use the Kelvin scales. Formulas are written for the Kelvin scale. And finally, let's take a look at an example. We see that example one says the lowest outdoor temperature ever recorded on Earth is negative 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is recorded in 1983 in Antarctica. What is the temperature on this, or on the Celsius, Kelvin, and Rankine scales? So, right away, let's start with what we know. We know that the temperature in the Fahrenheit scale is negative 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can start with our Celsius formula, and that says take 5 ninths of the quantity Tf, which we know again is negative 128.6 degrees, minus 32 degrees. And as a result, what we'll end up getting is negative, remember to subtract first, is negative 89.2 degrees Celsius. Then we can take that and find the Kelvin scale by taking the temperature in the Celsius scale, which in this case is negative. 89.2 degrees. Well, let's drop the units because it's going to be kelvins and degrees here. So this is plus 273, which gives us 183.3 uh, 0.8 kelvins. And finally, the temperature on the Rankine scale is just taking the Fahrenheit scale and adding 460. So we can go back to our Fahrenheit scale number and add 460 degrees. And I shouldn't really, I keep putting these Fahrenheit's, but I shouldn't. Because these are numbers that we're adding really in this case. And this equals 331.4 degrees Rankine. Okay, so Kelvin's are the only ones without degrees there. 